My name is Roy Silito and I work at the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute and I'm also a faculty member at Baylor College of Medicine. My expertise is mainly mouse genetics uh, with a focus on neuroscience and in addition what we're really interested in is how circuits develop in the brain. I'm interested in one region of the brain called the cerebellum. This region is mainly involved in controlling movement and it's located at the back of the brain. It's connected to many different regions that are also involved in motion such as the thalamus and basal ganglia. Uh, but in addition, recent work has shown that it's not only involved in movement, but it may also have a key role in non-motor functions as well. So one of the areas of the cerebellum that we focus on is the outer part of it called the cerebellar cortex. And one of the reasons we focus on that part is that this is where the neural computations mainly take place. Moreover, we know from several different diseases such as ataxia, dystonia and tremor, it is the cells in the cerebellar cortex that are primarily dysfunctional and in some cases even they, they degenerate. Within the cerebellar cortex, there's one primary cell type that really controls controls everything. It controls the patterning of the structure during embryogenesis as well as postnatal development. But in the adult, this one cell type called the Purkinje cell is required for all functional activity within the cerebellum. Our research started out by focusing on how Purkinje cells control the formation of all circuits in the cerebellum. But over time, we realized that by manipulating the Purkinje cell gene expression patterns or Purkinje cell function, we could reproduce or produce different disease phenotype that resembled very uh, clearly several different human disorders. The current goal of the lab is to understand how the cerebellum contributes to three primary diseases, ataxia, dystonia, and tremor. And so we're using the mouse to manipulate specifically Purkinje cell signaling and its downstream connectivity. Usually what we would do in the past is use the genetics to block uh, particular gene expression cascades or particular neuronal networks. But in the last five years we've been able to develop the tools to a point that we can selectively and specifically block neuronal communication at each type of synapse in the cerebellum independently. This has been able to give us a good handle on what each different cell type is doing. The long-term goal that we've started to think about uh, in the last two to three years. Once we started to become very interested in how can we produce these disease phenotypes in animal models, and we've been quite successful in doing so, that we can manipulate different parts of the cerebellum, and in the mice produce very clear and very distinct behaviors that resemble one of the three diseases we're interested in, dystonia, ataxia, and tremor. But this led us on to something much broader, is can we use this insight, what we've gained from the anatomy and physiology, to think about therapeutic strategies. The most recent projects we focused on is one that was actually quite a challenge, and I've been thinking about this for about 20 years now, was how does the brain become altered in dystonia? And this is traditionally a disease based on a region called the basal ganglia, which does communicate with the cerebellum. But recent work from several different groups has shown that the cerebellum might play a key role in dystonia. The question we had is how does it do this? We didn't know the circuit and we didn't know if the cerebellum can initiate dystonia. So what my graduate student Joshua White and I did is to come up with a strategy of altering specifically and only cerebellar circuits to see if we can produce dystonia-like behaviors in mice. And we were very successful in doing so. The importance of this, it gave us the first indication that by manipulating a single pathway in the cerebellum, we could produce a very strong dystonia that starts during development and lasts throughout the animal's life. The most significant uh, key to what these findings tell us is that we now finally have an idea of where the neural signals might start to be altered. In most diseases, you know that the brain state is altered. One of the challenges for therapeutics is what is the best region to target to try to remove these altered signals and normalize behavior. Our logic is that if we understand where the disease starts, this might be the best place to target uh, a therapeutic, whether it's deep brain stimulation or a different type of drug therapy. The current treatments for dystonia, one probably the most common is Botox. Um, a lot of patients with very specific dystonias will have Botox treatment that can last from several months to sometimes over a year. 
but in more severe cases and drug resistant forms of dystonia, people do have deep brain stimulation that's centered mainly in the basal ganglia. The problem with these strategies is that they don't always work and we're interested in understanding why they don't always work and offering patients the alternative approach or alternative targets from which uh, uh, neurosurgeons can target specifically with deep brain stimulation. And that's where our interest in cerebellum comes in, is that we think the cerebellum potentially might be a new target that might be available for therapy in patients that don't normally respond to deep brain stimulation from the traditional methods.